Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. First, I want to thank Professor Athanasakos and Ivy Business School. It is an incredible honor to be here speaking at a center named after Ben Graham himself. I can't even begin to count the number of times that I've read both Security Analysis and The Intelligent Investor, but I can tell you that those counts are still in the running. It is also a tremendous honor to be part of a presenter lineup of truly renowned value investors in their own rights, investors whose letters I eagerly anticipate and like Ben Graham's work, I often reread. Now, if you were registered to attend this same event last year, you may already be aware that the title of my speech was Values Investing, ESG Frameworks that Minimize Risks and Maximize Returns. And as you probably saw in the program, that title has stayed exactly the same. Last year, I had the expectation that I would head in person, of course, to Ivy Business School to not only speak, but really on a mission to pound the table and persuade the audience that robust environmental, social, and governance analysis is an absolutely critical component of a modern value investment strategy. And as an investor who invests not only through the prism of value, but also as a shareholder activist, I do, at least in a metaphorical sense, consider pounding the table to be squarely within my circle of competence. But then 2020 came, and 2020 stole my thunder and in many ways pounded the ESG table for me. 2020 was nothing if not a year when globally cataclysmic events drove profound and across-the-board transformation. And it was a year that put to rest any notion that environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities exist as mere footnotes to investing analysis. COVID-19 and the recurring West Coast fires were painful reminders of the increasingly catastrophic impacts sustained from extreme environmental events. The COVID-19 crisis further underscored the dire need for strong social policies and practices that protect the health and well-being of corporate stakeholders, most especially frontline employees. And the racial justice protests have demanded the long time coming recognition that structural racism persists and must be redressed by among other efforts, driving diversity, equity, and inclusion across workforces and directly into corporate boardrooms and C-suites, a critical aspect of governance and oversight. So why then, given 2020's undeniable success in pounding the ESG table, did I choose to leave my topic unchanged? Because while ESG and sustainability themes dominate business and investment news headlines, let's be clear. The incorporation of ESG risk factors and opportunities into investing strategies has nearly exclusively boiled down to standalone ESG funds, or less frequently, as an aspect of growth investing analysis. We rarely, if ever, hear these financially material topics and factors discussed within the context of value investing frameworks and strategies. So I am here one year later to sound the alarm and yes, to even pound the table that not only are environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities of vital importance to value investors, they are perhaps most vitally important to value investors when compared against every other type of investor out there. Why is that the case? Because while most every investment strategy seeks to generate upside returns, and make no mistake, sustainable policies and practices have been shown to be especially effective predictors of upside opportunity. We as value investors are also unwaveringly, if not notoriously, focused on investing with a margin of safety to protect the downside over the long term. As legendary small cap value pioneer, and I'm most honored to say IDES Capital investor Chuck Royce most succinctly states, risk is as important as reward. If we as value investors want to successfully identify compelling risk reward investment opportunities over the long term, we must understand and incorporate ESG considerations into our investment analysis. So I'm here to firmly state that the hour is late and value investors who fail to consider ESG may indeed be existing on borrowed time. If instead, we want to truly embrace the theme of today's conference and celebrate Ben Graham in a world that questions value investing, we must recognize that the long-term weighing machine is poised to reward those companies that best care for their stakeholders that efficiently and ethically allocate capital, and that focus their resources on sustainable and inclusive outcomes. With that in mind, let's turn to a deeper dive. First, we'll look into the history of what we now term ESG, which to be sure is a long history indeed. Next, we'll turn to what is often the starting point of value investment diligence, understanding the downside risks inherent in a prospective investment. 
will then turn to the upside to explore how robust ESG practices can generate opportunities that not only satisfy a value investing checklist, but can do so over the long term. And finally, I want to touch upon the essential role of engagement. I'll share a current IDES portfolio investment that exemplifies how we as activist investors work with companies to not only drive operational capital allocation and strategic enhancements, but we'll also share our founding focus on improvements to material ESG and sustainability policies and practices. And I'll close out my presentation today by imploring everyone here to not only begin incorporating ESG analysis into your value investment decision-making process, but to further practice what I term to be true investment stewardship. So with that, let's begin the deep dive. Perhaps aside from the seemingly never-ending stream of newly launched SPACs, ESG is the topic in investment management today. In fact, it is estimated that more than $20 trillion, or approximately two-thirds of the current value of the entire S&P 500, will flow into ESG-focused assets in the coming decades. But to be clear, issues and opportunities that we now group together and refer to under the umbrella terms of ESG and sustainability are nothing new. And though you may not consider yourself to be an ESG investor, it is very likely that you may already be taking into account some of these considerations in your investment process. Far from new, history is in fact full of examples of enterprises of all types generating negative environmental, social, and governance externalities. In other words, costs imposed upon third parties who did not agree to be burdened by those costs. A classic example of a negative externality is a manufacturer that generates air pollution, levying both health and cleanup costs on third parties and on society at large. In this case, the actual costs associated with the products are not fully borne by the manufacturer, creating a vicious cycle where the manufacturer may actually be incentivized to produce more goods than it would if it had to pay the full costs associated with production. When this happens, the parties impacted by these negative externalities will often hit a breaking point and may then take action and force the enterprise to internalize the full costs associated with their operations. Now, as I've already highlighted, we are in a moment where ESG dominates headlines, and it is fair to say that weak ESG practitioners are now being compelled to internalize burdens at a very fast pace. In a moment, we'll explore some of the more meaningful dynamics driving this accelerated reckoning. But first, it is critically important to recognize that when it comes to ESG and sustainability, everything old really is new again. Companies being compelled to clean up their ESG acts is not a novel concept. And over the course of history, there are many forces at play, but three particular mechanisms of change stand out as those that have been most responsible for enhanced standards around environmental, social, and governance practices. First, changes in public sector policy, in other words, legislation, administrative agency regulation, and judicial decisions. Second, private sector self-regulation. And third, public pressure in combination with the media. Now, it's worth noting at the outset that the lines between each one of these mechanisms of change are not crystal clear. They influence one another. So let's first examine the role that public sector policy changes play in evolving ESG standards. Over the course of history, regulation of private actors has existed as a central feature of government. The first U.S. federal environmental law was the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. Now, there were many controversies that prompted this legislation, which prohibits the unauthorized dumping of materials, including mud, oil, refuse, and as you can see in the photo, timber into water sources. The act further prohibits the unauthorized construction of dams and navigable waters, a big problem at the time of enactment since many companies were damming rivers to generate no or low cost to them electrical power. Government has similarly been long focused on social externalities like worker and occupational safety. In 1893, Congress passed the Safety Appliance Act, the first law intended primarily to improve workplace safety, which mandated that the rail industry install protective equipment like sophisticated braking systems. Within a decade of the passage of the act, safety equipment had been widely integrated across trains, fatalities had fallen off dramatically, and rail company payments had risen from 200 to more than 2,000 per trainman fatality. And turning to corporate governance, the ideas and standards around governance have existed for decades. The 1970s, however, were a boom for modern corporate governance, with the term first appearing in the Federal Register in 1976. The enhanced scrutiny around corporate governance was also a front and center issue in the SEC's landmark proceedings against three outside directors at Penn Central, which had filed for what was at the time 
the largest bankruptcy in United States history. The proceedings found that Penn Central's directors had misrepresented the company's financial condition and failed in the oversight of a wide range of misconduct by Penn Central executives, generating billions of dollars in shareholder losses. Moving on, private sector indices, industry self-regulation is also nothing new and remains a driving force of change. Now, a cynic could suggest that this self-regulation is an attempt by private industry to get ahead of public sector oversight. But irrespective of motivation, the reality is that weak ESG practitioners have long been brought into line by their peers and by industry-specific self-regulating organizations. For example, after the 1979 Three Mile Island nuclear, nuclear reaction meltdown, the U.S. nuclear power industry responded by creating the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, which sets industry-wide criteria and performance objectives and also conducts regular plant evaluations. In a more recent example, highlighting industry self-regulation of social issues, the Business Roundtable recently revamped its statement on the purpose of a corporation, asserting that corporations should not just serve shareholders, but should serve all stakeholders, including employees and communities. And finally, stock exchanges compel their issuers to conform with many governance standards, such as the New York Stock Exchange's requirement that a majority of a board's directors be independent. The third significant force driving corporate internalization of ESG burdens is the very powerful combination of public pressure with the media. We exist in a world where most everyone has a camera in their pocket with the ability to instantly upload footage to social media, footage that has been distributed across the internet and over traditional media outlets running on a 24 seven, 365 days a year timetable. Critically, media and public pressure are not only change agents in their own rights, but they influence both government action and private sector self-regulation as well. And perhaps there is no better way to highlight the colossal degree of influence encompassed by public pressure in the media than by handing it off to John Oliver of Last Week Tonight. So what can we really do here? Well, the real behavior change has to come from plastics manufacturers themselves. Without that, nothing significant is going to happen. We have to make them internalize the costs of the pollution that they are creating. And there is a way to do this through a concept called extended producer responsibility or the polluter pays principle. The idea is to create laws that essentially shift responsibility and the costs of collection from the public sector and all of us to the actual producers of the plastic waste. EPR laws could, among other things, force companies to either create the infrastructure and markets to recycle the products they make or force them to stop making them altogether. The US is one of the only developed countries on earth without a national EPR law addressing packaging because of course it is. But on the positive side here, several states are currently considering EPR laws and there was even a national law introduced in the last Congress. It went nowhere, but it will soon be introduced again. And we are going to need some version of an EPR law to pass and soon because this problem is only getting worse. Plastic production is expected to triple by 2050. And it is obvious that meaningful change is only going to come through being able to force this very powerful industry to do things that it has shown for half a century it has absolutely no interest in doing. We have to make them change. And if not for our sake or the sake of future generations, let's at least do it for all the fish who are about to be outnumbered by plastic in the ocean. Just like me! Ain't that right, John? Exactly, Slurp. Just like you. That's with this understanding that evolving ESG standards are really just one other more example of history repeating itself, albeit at what is now an undeniably faster clip, we are almost ready to focus on the e integration of ESG considerations within value investment diligence. But before moving on, I do want to highlight several additional dynamics that are specifically underpinning the investment world's expanding attention to ESG and sustainability factors. Now, while some might see this as a fad at IDES, we believe that ESG is here to stay and for good reason. We are living in a world of improved corporate transparency around ESG policies and practices. We are living in an era of enhanced corporate disclosures and his of historic and current ESG data points, statistics, and metrics. And we expect this ex expansion and available information to only continue. We are further living in an era of never before available data analysis driven by AI enhanced computing capabilities. And finally, we are also living with the understanding that we are facing what many consider to be existential, environmental, and social threats. 
this combination of transparency, data availability, and analytical power against the backdrops of existential concerns and round-the-clock public scrutiny is driving an ESG renaissance within the investment landscape from which we believe there is no turning back. So what? With the historical context behind us, let's fast forward to the present and consider how we as value investors must incorporate ESG factors into our investment decision-making process. I've highlighted as an activist, I am sometimes in the business of metaphorical table pounding, which means that I'm also in the business of offering up carrots and sticks. So I'll begin this part of my presentation like any true value investor would with the sticks, or in other words, with the consideration of material downside risks inherent in ESG shortcomings and failures. And there is no better way to do this than a review of several recent ESG interest incidents and controversies at large publicly traded companies. The numbers don't lie. Weak ESG policies and practices and unsustainable business models are clear risk factors for value destruction. Savita Subramanian and the ESG team at Bank of America Merrill Lynch recently issued a note that examined the market valuation impact of a significant ESG controversy at 24 large cap companies, and that analysis is striking. More than $500 billion in shareholder value destruction within a year of the incidents. Digging in, let's take a closer look at three specific ESG controversies. And at this point, I do want to provide notice that I'll be discussing three extremely disturbing corporate incidents involving BP, Wynn Resorts, and Boeing Airlines, should these incidents be of an especially sensitive nature for anyone joining in today. First, let's consider the downside embodied in environmental risks. On April 20th, 2010, BP's Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded in what is considered to this day to be the largest marine oil spill in history, with more than 210 million gallons of petroleum discharged into the Gulf of Mexico. Tragically, 11 were killed and 17 were injured in this explosion. According to the final independent study, the environmental disaster was preventable, but BP did not possess a functional safety culture. The loss of human life comes at an unmeasurable price and economic comparisons fall flat in the face of it. The company has nevertheless experienced financial impact and thus far has paid $65 million in cleanup costs and legal fees and $20 million to settle, to settle federal and state claims, the largest settlement of its type. In the months following the tragedy, BP's stock fell by more than 40% and 12 years later remains more than 50% below the pre-disaster valuation. Weak social policies and practices can similarly entail significant risks. On January 26, 2018, a Wall Street Journal report first broke allegations against Wynn Resorts chairman and CEO Steve Wynn, who stood accused of a long patter, pattern of sexual misconduct with casino employees. The report revealed that multiple parties had filed complaints through proper channels within the company, but with no repercussions. Within weeks, both the Nevada and Massachusetts Gaming Commissions launched investigations, and Wynn resigned as chair and CEO. Eventually, Wynn Resorts paid the largest fines in Gaming Commission history, totaling more than $55 million. Wynn's stock price declined by more than 20% within months of the scandal breaking, and more than three years later, remains more than 30% below pre-scandal prices. Finally, governance failures generate material downside risks for investors and tragically can result in loss of human life. On March 13, 2019, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration grounded Boeing 737 MAX after the two horrific crashes, which killed 346 passengers and crew members. In the months following the grounding, a multi-year pattern emerged of Boeing engineers raising 737 MAX red flags with executives, only to be ignored. One engineer even sent a letter to Boeing's board outlining his grave concerns about failures within the program. No action was taken by the board, and less than three weeks later, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 crashed. The loss of human life is an incalculable loss and has resulted in criminal pen penalties for Boeing. Those penalties totaled $2.5 billion, including a victim fund, and Boeing has further sustained estimated financial losses of more than $80 billion. Boeing's market value decreased by 30% after the groundings, and the stock remains more than 40% below pre-incident valuations. As we see in these controversies, ESG failures criminally jeopardize human safety and lives and further encompass a host of material risks that broadly impact corporate stakeholders. And their valuations have adjusted to reflect these inexcusable failures. 
In addition to the financial losses, it is worth consider considering the justified destruction of brand values sustained by BP, Wynn Resorts, and Boeing, each a company with broad levels of consumer awareness. These hits to valuation make sense against the backdrop of corporate balance sheets that have been fundamentally transformed over the past generation. In 1998, intangible assets, which include intellectual property and brand, brand equity, represented less than 30% of the book value of the S&P 500. Today, intangible assets represent nearly 70% of book value, exposing weak ESG practitioners to significant value destruction through reputational damage. As Warren Buffett most effectively highlighted during his tenure writing the wrongs at Solomon Brothers, lose money for the firm, even a lot of money, and I will be understanding. Lose reputation for the firm, even a shred of reputation, and I will be ruthless. Value investors seeking to invest with a margin of safety must develop a comprehensive understanding of the potential exposure to intangible asset value destruction through a framework that incorporates environmental, social, and governance risk factors. Moving on from the sticks to the enticement of carrots, let's now look at the compelling upside opportunities inherent in strong ESG and sustainability practitioners. There is no doubt that over the past year, the value proposition in companies with robust ESG policies and practices and sustainable business models was proven out by the performance of ESG equity funds, which on average outperformed their non-ESG peers by several hundred basis points. To understand the upside opportunity inherent in companies with robust ESG, let's review several reliably positive performance dynamics that we can consider and incorporate into our process to identify value investing opportunities. First, ESG factors exhibit superior alpha generation when compared against measures of quality. In a recent report, the ESG team at Bank of America Merrill Lynch enhanced the risk-adjusted returns of several investment strategies with, in one model, ESG, and in another model, quality. The results were conclusive. ESG is a better adjunct to enhance risk-adjusted returns in six out of seven strategies, including forward earnings yield, dividend yield, dividend growth, and price return, among others. The team similarly found that ESG was the best signal for predicting future earnings risk. Companies that are ranked higher by ESG data providers see lower futures earning volatility. And conversely, those companies in the worst quartile of ESG ratings saw significantly greater earnings deterioration. Companies with strong ESG ratings have lower risk profiles and therefore enjoy significantly lower costs of capital. For example, the strongest MSCI ESG performers enjoy debt borrowing costs that are nearly 2% lower than the debt borrowing costs of the weakest ESG performers. Strong ESG ratings are a predictive signal of future return on equity, with the strongest ESG performers generating returns on equity that are nearly 4% higher than the weakest ESG performers. Circling back to our earlier examination of the business round tables, pardon me, <laughs> of the business round tables new statement on the purpose of a corporation, the three and five year annualized returns of signatory S&P 500 companies outperformed the broader S&P by between 150 and 250 basis points on average. And saving what is perhaps the best for last when it comes to ESG and the upside opportunity, companies with the strongest ESG profiles garner higher valuations. Over a 12-year analysis, companies with top ESG ratings saw consistent increases in their relative forward PE multiples and now often command a 20% or greater premium above the weakest ESG performers. The evidence and analysis is overwhelming. In addition to protection of the downside, the identification of companies with strong ESG policies and practices sets a strong stage for maximized upside returns. Finally, I want to move into the topic of engagement. Now, as shareholder activists, we clearly exist on the most involved end of the shareholder engagement spectrum. 
while we're always prepared to provide a company's shareholders with an opportunity to speak for themselves on important matters, we largely enjoy extremely constructive engagements with the fiduciaries at our portfolio companies. And I have to say that our focus on ESG is a big part of that constructive process. Our focus on ESG and sustainability elevates our dialogues. So today, I'm excited to share one such a case study with you. IDE's investment in Arcosa. Arcosa in many ways embodies a prototype IDE's investment. Arcosa first hit our radar after it was spun out of Trinity Industries as an infrastructure-focused conglomerate with three distinct business segments. An engineered structure segment provided wind tower components and grid hardening products and services. A transpor transportation segment that includes a quasi-domestic monopoly on the production of inland barges. And a crown jewel construction aggregate segment. Arcosa is a true long-term compounder value investment opportunity. It is recession resistant. It is a consistent cash generator with a pristine balance sheet. It has a very strong management team and has significant strategic buyer interest for each one of its underlying business segments. Additionally, as a conglomerate, Arcosa is well-suited to our activist ability to shine a light on complicated but compelling value stories. So when we first began to diligence Arcosa, we were struck by a company with several overarchingly positive ESG themes, clean and renewable energy, low emissions, low energy transportation offerings, and grid resiliency, among others. But we also noted a business that could certainly be considered a potential ESG outlier, construction aggregates, which is nevertheless a business model that consistently garners high multiples given pricing power across cycles. So we dug in and we found that one, Arcosa's management team was extraordinarily and proactively focused on the environmental issues often inherent within this business, including land management and water usage. Two, there was a significant opportunity to, to transparently report the strong oversight to the street. And three, there was a further opportunity to expand into a budding environmentally sound business line within the aggregate space, recycled aggregates. Recycled aggregates could be considered an environmental and financial win-win. They restore usage to materials that would historically have been thrown away, and they do so at what is a better value for customers with nevertheless strong profit margins at Arcosa. Recycled aggregates decrease landfill usage and improve air quality by reducing haul distances and energy consumption. Given the pristine Arcosa balance sheet, there was flexibility to build this environmentally sound business within Arcosa, and most especially through strategic acquisitions. And that is exactly what has happened. Over the course of our ownership in Arcosa, the company leveraging that pristine balance sheet has made two recycled aggregates acquisitions, immediately giving Arcosa the leading position in the domestic recycled aggregate space. But to be clear, our ESG focus at Arcosa is broad and spans not only environmental topics, but social and governance matters as well. Overarchingly, we identified within Arcosa a very significant opportunity to enhance transparent reporting of current and historic ESG statistics, policies, practices, and forward-looking goals. It is worth noting that the transparency opportunity is one that I would highlight as not only a strong risk mitigator and value enhancer, but an especially outsized opportunity at small and mid-capitalization public companies where we focus our energies at IDES. Weak disclosure presents what I would term an informational edge opportunity for value investors who are willing to roll up their sleeves and understand ESG statistics, policies, and practices on a pre-disclosure basis. These investors are then poised to be rewarded for that work. As corporate ESG reporting improves, the street applies what we've already seen are reliably higher forward valuation ratings. In addition to the enhanced disclosure around ESG policies and practices, Arcosa has provided disclosure and outlined clear goals on several social issues, including workforce diversity and employee safety and well-being. Arcosa is also making solid progress towards an even stronger corporate governance practice, as evidenced by the very recent announcement that it is destaggering its classified board. We look forward to our continued investment in Arcosa, which we believe is well positioned to benefit from not only strong secular tailwinds and exceptional management, but already robust and still improving ESG and sustainability policies and practices. Now we are fast approaching the end of my time with you. We've explored the history of ESG. We've done a deep dive into the both, both the material downside risks and the compelling upside opportunities presented by the dual edged sword that is ESG and sustainability. 
we further explored how transparent ESG disclosures, improved ESG policies and practices, and a capital allocation strategy focused on financial and environmental win-win investments has combined to drive long-term value at Arcosa Inc., a top eyes holding. And so at this point, I hope I've successfully convinced you that the case is clear. ESG is vital to modern day value investing strategies. And I wanna wrap up our time by discussing a topic that as a shareholder activist is of particular significance to me. And as an ESG focused investor pays dividends, the role of investment stewardship, which is especially timely since we are in the midst of proxy season. As a shareholder activist, I am often faced with the need to take action and address two problems common to public companies, problems that we have seen overarchingly challenge corporate sustainability. The agency problem that can arise when fiduciary interests depart from those of their shareholders, and the collective action problem often inherent in public companies, given many shareholders with disparate interests, financial objectives, and holding periods. Now, as activists, we are certainly empowered by an augmented engagement toolkit, but I want to be clear, after many years of taking action to correct these overhangs, I am left with two profound con conclusions. First, disengaged fiduciaries and shareholders present threats to long-term corporate sustainability. And second, we, the community of value investors, are uniquely positioned to help remedy this wrong. As value investors, we do deep dives, so we are especially well-prepared to ask the tough questions. We buy with the goals of reduced risk and steady and consistent compounding. And these are important objectives for fiduciaries to be reminded of within the context of their decision-making capacities. And maybe most importantly of all, we are long-term. So even when they might want us to, we generally do not go away. Companies must deal with us. As such, we are a force unto ourselves and we are uniquely positioned to ensure the overarching long-term sustainability of the companies that we own. With that in mind, I encourage everyone here to embrace investment stewardship because this is how our values drive value. And as part of that, please consider, how do you use your voice? How do you vote your proxy? And how do you exercise the tremendous responsibility that comes with the privilege of being an asset owner? How do you engage to tip the long-term weighing machine toward sustainable, inclusive, and profitable outcomes. And with that, I wanna conclude by expressing my gratitude for your interest in joining me today. And I look forward to any questions that you may have for me later on as part of the panel.